Uh, good evening. You're very welcome uh, to our Young Professionals Network webinar uh, on Brexit and the future of EU reporting in Ireland. Uh, my name is Dara Moriarty. I'm a researcher and press officer at the Institute and I also chair our YPN group. Uh, we're delighted this evening to be joined by Rowan McCormack, who is assistant editor with the Irish Times. Um, and just a, just a brief note on our celebrations for our 30th anniversary, which we'll be doing throughout the month of May. And um, you might have seen uh, some of our communications already by email and on social media. But some of the speakers we have uh, include Commissioner Mary McGuinness, who will actually be speaking to us this Friday. Um, Larry Summers is going to be speaking to us next week, Simon Coveney. Uh, we're going to have the Taoiseach, Michael Martin, deliver a really big speech on Ireland and Europe. Um, and also we're going to have Bertie Ahern and Tony Blair for an in-conversation session on Anglo-Irish relations. And then towards the end of the month, we're going to have pre former President Mary Robinson address climate justice. So um, all the events that we're doing in May are completely free to attend. Uh, so do keep an eye on iiea.com forward slash events for more information on all of that. Um, just on tonight's topic, obviously Brexit and the future of EU reporting in Ireland and its impact. Um, I suppose at the IEA, you know, since 2015, since even 2014, um, Brexit is an issue that we've, we've covered from all angles, um, uh, but the impact that Brexit is going to have on how Irish people con consume European affairs news is something we haven't really gotten to in great detail. And now that Brexit has sort of become a reality, it's something that's really going to hit us. And I think we need to get to grips with that issue. Um, I'll shortly hand over to Ruan, who's going to address that very topic tonight. Um, I think he's going to begin with a bit of a bigger, broader focus on how the European citizens that consume EU news, it's a bit distorted because a lot of the news we get now comes from outside of the EU. Um, and he wrote a very interesting column recently on how that's particularly acute in the Irish sense and in the Irish case because of how much British media we actually consume here. Um, before I introduce Ruan formally, just let me briefly flag some of the housekeeping issues for our Zooms. I'm sure you're all well accustomed to them by now. Um, we do want to hear from you throughout the discussion and you can get involved in the Q&A uh, session by using Zoom's Q&A function. Um, and also if you're into this sort of thing on Twitter, you can, you can get engaged as well using the handle at IIEA and the hashtag YPN, hashtag IIEA30. Um, I'll just briefly introduce Ruan now before handing the floor over. Um, he's assistant editor at the Irish Times. As I mentioned, he's held that position since 2017. Uh, prior to taking on that role, he was a foreign affairs correspondent, legal affairs correspondent and Paris correspondent with the paper. In over 12 years at the Irish Times, he's reported from more than 40 countries. Um, and his first book, The Supreme Court, uh, was widely acclaimed and it was published by Penguin in 2016. Uh, Ruan, uh, thanks once again for, for making the time this evening to join us. I know you've spoken to the YPN a couple of times over the years and we really do appreciate it. Uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Dara, and uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, I'll keep these uh, introductory remarks brief enough and we can, uh, we can then leave a bit of time for, for Q&A afterwards. I guess the issue I'm going to highlight um, is one that's not new, but has, I think, become more apparent and certainly more problematic since the uh, UK left the European Union. It's also something I have a personal or, or at least professional interest in, in that I guess now I work for one of the few English language media organizations operating in the EU uh, that spends a lot of time and resources on these, these questions on how to cover the European Union um, for, our, for our readership, for our audience. So it's something we, we think a lot about. So what's the issue? The issue is that the market for news about the EU is dominated by players who are now outside the Union. Why is that a problem? Because I think it skews how the European Union sees itself, or rather how certain EU states um, see it, and I, I might come back to that distinction. But I think it also distorts how the rest of the world sees the European Union as well. When I say the market's dominated by non-EU players, I'm thinking of their global reach. Um, you know, so if you look at the three standard measures of, of reach in this industry, so traffic, subscriptions, um, social media numbers. The biggest players in that field by a long shot are English language outlets. Um, and that's not to say that you don't have a lot of French and German and Italian um, media organizations that are vastly influential, of course you do. Um, but 
their influence, I guess, is circumscribed by language. So I'm thinking of publishers like the FT, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Reuters, Bloomberg, uh, and so on. And I'd argue that these organizations, brilliant as they are, I'm a big fan of all of them, um, but that these organizations have a disproportionate role in shaping public opinion, public understandings of the European Union. Um, and as I say, that was always there, but Brexit has made it more apparent and, and possibly more, more, more awkward for the European Union. Um, I wrote a column about this recently um, and uh, I got a response, um, a, a blog post actually, a really considered blog post by, um, by Joshua Benton of the Neiman Institute at Harvard. And he, he studies these questions and, and, and is very thoughtful about them. And he put it very well, I thought. He said, I quote, what if the distant news outlets covering the United States weren't cloistered in DC or New York? What if they were all, I don't know, in Iceland or Costa Rica or Morocco or Japan? Or what if they were all in a country that used to be part of the United States, but which had recently seceded from the Union and made a big scene of it on the way out? How do you think we'd feel about that? End quote. I should enter a couple of caveats here. I'm not saying that the standard of EU coverage from big English language media, whether in the UK or the US, is poor, you know, far from it. I think these outlets are filled with really skilled, uh, professional, well-informed journalists who are doing great work, who, who I read every day. Um, and nor am I claiming that, uh, say, the New York Times sets the terms of reference on European debate in, in France, for example. Plainly, it's not that straightforward. But what does happen, I think, is that, um, as a result of those outlets wide reach and influence in big media markets across the world, their stories get picked up, they get followed up, they get amplified, they get translated, which is really important. So when Emmanuel Macron wants to speak to the people of Europe, he does one of two things. He sends a, a sort of a syndicated opinion piece to media organizations around the European Union. He's done it with us on several occasions. Or he does an interview with the FT. Um, and you know, you've seen a couple of examples of this recently because he knows that if he says something half interesting and it appears in the FT, it'll get picked up. And the same is true of, of Bloomberg and Reuters and several, several others as well. Um, and while you get a lot of really good journalists covering EU affairs in these, in these outlets, there's a sort of a structural issue at play, um, <clears throat> which is that while the reporter writes the story, the story is commissioned by um, it's, it's, it's dressed up by, the angle is chosen by news desks that are not based in the European Union, that are not based in Brussels for the most part. They're in London, they're in New York, they might be in Tokyo, you know, wherever. Um, and so these important commissioning decisions, these important framing decisions are made by editors who are not plugged in in the same way that reporters are. Um, they are concerned primarily with their principal or the largest share of their audience, which is going to be in the US or the UK or, or wherever else. And so, you know, the frame of reference is different. You know, the questions you ask of a story in those circumstances are different. Now, I'd argue that um, this situation is at the root of a certain type of misinformation about the EU. So I'm not talking about the willful deceit of, of certain tabloids who, who sort of set out to, to mislead. I'm talking about a, a sort of a different form of misinformation, which is rooted, I think, in, in misunderstanding. I chose three examples when I wrote the column recently um, under, this, under this heading. And I'll just read them out as single statements. The first example is the idea that France wants EU corporate tax harmonization because its president has it in for Ireland, okay? The second example I chose was that Germany's car industry will eventually force Angela Merkel to give London a good Brexit deal, okay? And the third one was that the EU wants to block all vaccine exports, exports, <laughs> exports to the UK. Now, all of these three claims are false yet they're accepted or were accepted as fact in many outlets by many commentators for a long time and still, still are in many cases. They're particularly prevalent in the English language media and they are, I'm sure, uh, still believed by very many people in spite of, of, of them being false. 
So clearly linguistic obstacles are important here. Um, this type of information flourishes in places where people don't speak a lot of languages, don't have access to other sources of information. And I'll, I'll come back to the question of language and translation in a second. I mentioned the dominance of British and American players in particular and how that I think distorts the global view of the European Union. So the, the external view uh, of the European Union. Um, Wolfgang Blau, he's a former senior executive at Condé Nast International, the big publishing house. Um, he's written some really interesting stuff on this, on this very topic. And he argues that UK US dominance in news is one of the reasons global coverage of the EU so often frames the European Union as a remote economic zone with a firmly economic personality and one that's perpetually on the brink of collapse. You know, so it's in other words, it's a, it's a sort of a simplified um, external view of what's going on in the European Union. And that's the frame through which a lot of this coverage is, is channeled. So what can be done about all of this? Well, one solution is for us all to learn a couple of languages, um, I guess, um, you know, so that we can vary our consumption and, and read different sources on different topics. Um, but you know, obviously that's not gonna happen or it's not gonna happen very quickly, at least. Um, another way to mitigate the effect is to translate. Um, we all know that Google Translate is really useful, but we also know that, um, that machine translation still has a long way to go and it's not yet at the standard we would need for this to be intuitive and, and, and available to us uh, in, a, in a sort of a systematic way. So while we're waiting for it, I think there's a lot that media outlets themselves can do. Um, for example, at the Irish Times, we have some really good relationships with small uh, startups who specialize in translation. They specialize in you know, identifying really good journalism wherever in the European Union it's, it's um, produced, translating it, um, dressing it up for international circulation, making it available to us and to others. Some of it we pay for, some of it we get for free, but it's been a really useful service to us when we've been covering sort of pan-European topics. We used it a lot at the time of the, uh, the last European elections where we published a good few uh, opinion pieces from writers in different countries who were looking at what the, you know, what the election campaign issues were uh, in, in their countries. In, in addition to that, you have a lot of other legacy um, media outlets like Le Monde and El Pais who publish English, English language sections periodically. So, you know, it's a, it's a very conscious effort to broaden uh, the reach of their journalism by having it translated and made available in English uh, online. Then you have broadcast outlets like uh, Euronews that receive significant European Commission funding and do a, do a really good job. You have a lot of other sort of transnational media collaborations that are funded by the European Union. And then there's a slightly different category, which is um, media initiatives or projects or, or businesses that are aimed at the Brussels bubble. Um, so I'm thinking of, you know, really good organizations like Politico Europe or the New European. And what they're doing very well is targeting what is a relatively um, homogenous or at least coherent audience in, in, in the case of the Brussels, um, you know, the cosmopolitan uh, circles in, in Brussels, uh, English speaking for the most part as well. Um, I should point out that one of the obvious reasons that more hasn't been done here is that, um, that there are sort of commercial obstacles to targeting a European audience as such. You know, so one is obviously language, but the other is that there is no pan-European ad market and it's notoriously difficult to build a, um, a subscription base in a market where you're not that familiar, where you're not familiar with the audience and the audience isn't that familiar with you. So, you know, there, there are some big, big obstacles. So what you can take from what I've just said is that I have much more faith in our ability to diagnose the problem than in our ability to solve it. Um, but what I might actually do is just maybe leave it there and, uh, and leave, it, leave it to the audience to, to sort of identify what they're interested in and what we might come back at. So maybe, maybe we'll leave it there, Darren, I'll come, come back uh, in a yeah. minute. That's perfect, uh, everyone. Look, Cheers, thanks very much for, for that initial, um, those initial couple of remarks. And um, as everyone mentions, you know, um, audience members watching in, uh, please feel free to, to get involved. Uh, you can submit your questions using the Q&A function um, and we'll, we'll get to them as well. I'm just going to kick off myself now with one or two questions. Um, 
Rowan, you mentioned the the, the Harvard um, academic who sort of did a response piece uh, to your column around your diagnosis of this problem. Um, what other sort of reactions have you received? You know, I think uh, Twitter can be an unforgiving place. Was there any people who who um, had 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 some critiques or analysis of your piece? Was there any holes that were pointed out? And if there were, how would you address them? Uh, yes, it won't surprise you to hear that there were some 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 critiques on Twitter. All right, um, but they were they were all really good, and and two of the points struck me in particular. Um, one was that this is more of an Irish problem than I had um, than I had acknowledged in the piece, you know, that Ireland, uh, for obvious reasons, is really heavily exposed to the media market, the English language media market. And so we are much more susceptible to the distortions that I'm describing in, in the article and again here today. And I think, you know, that is valid. Uh, you know, I think, I think that's true, no question. Um, Clearly, Ireland is more exposed to the media market. It's much more the, the English language market. It's much more aware of what's being said in the UK and the US um, around these around these questions. Um, you know, so so that's that's self evident. However, you know, I would say that in you know I described how something that appears in a in an English language media outlet that has a vast global reach will travel faster around the world you know it'll be followed up it'll be picked up by other media organizations it'll be translated i think that that has an effect in countries where you where they don't speak english you know so i, I i've spent years living in france six or seven years um you know over the last 15 20 years living in france and you know i could see firsthand how something that appeared in the new york times or the ft had a way of working its way back into uh, into the French media, the same thing happens in Germany. You know, of course, if you're in a large country like France or Germany, they're big enough to create their own re reality in a way that Ireland is not. Um, you know, so so there is that. But I, I think to some degree or another, this is a factor everywhere in the European Union. The other criticism I got on Twitter um, was uh, the argument that, well, what are you doing about it? You know, what's the Irish Times doing about this? And and you know, that's absolutely valid as well. You know, it's not as though we're a disinterested uh, observer here. Um, what we're doing is, uh, I've mentioned some of the relationships we've built up and we've spent a lot of time uh, working on those, you know, looking for potential partners around the continent. Uh, I was just speaking to somebody from a French newspaper about a month ago about another relationship along those lines. Um, you know, we, we invest pretty heavily in our European coverage. We've got correspondence around around the continent in, in key capitals. And we've got a lot of freelance journalists who, who work with us a lot in, in places where we don't have staff. Um, you know, we give it a lot of space in print. We give it a lot of, um, you know, we, we run a lot of stories online every day uh, from, from around Europe. So I guess that's what we're doing. You know, there's always more that we can be doing. Um, it's something that we've been giving a lot of thought to since Brexit, not since Brexit occurred, but since Brexit, since the Brexit referendum, because we know that we have a not insignificant audience in the UK who are interested in our perspective on Ireland, the UK and Europe. We know also that we have a, um, a significant enough audience around the European Union who we think are, tuned, are, are logging on and reading our journalism for much the same reason. So it has prompted us over the last couple of years to think quite hard about how we, how we cater to that European audience. Mm -hmm. You mentioned there, uh, Rowan, sort of, you know, the, the question posed to you, um, you know, affiliated with the Irish Times in terms of, in terms of what are you doing about it? I suppose one one national measure that 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 the government here has taken is to establish the the Future of Media Commission, um, and that they're, they're sort of they're in the process of, of of running a series of webinars, and they're going to publish, um, you know, a series of recommendations and so on, um, coming out of that. I mean, how how do you see that shaping up and sort of impacting this this problem you've diagnosed. I mean, is there is there anything you would like to see that commission do or or to assist uh, the broader Irish media to to cover Europe better or or any 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 particular thoughts on that? I think it's really good that the commission was set up. Um, you know, the Irish Times was one of many organisations and individuals that submitted some ideas to it, and we, we we've 
we published those those suggestions. Uh, we we ran a story of our own on, on on our proposals. I'm also involved. I'm a member of the press council, so I've I've been watching it with that hat on as well. I've been tuning into some of their public um, consultation events. Um, I, I really wish them well and 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 hope they they uh, ho hope they make the best of it. I think I don't envy them because they've got a really really broad remit and and these questions are not simple. They're not straightforward. Um, and so they have a lot to get through. Um, and so they'll be doing really well to marshal all that information and to come up with proposals in the, in the amount of time they have. Um, you know, a lot of these questions around the future of the media, how to fund media in the digital age are really well rehearsed. And, and I, won't, I won't waste too much of your time going into it here, but you know, the, the kernel of the issue is how you make this economic or how you create um, a climate in which media organizations can make this uh, economically vi viable. But, you know, talking about these questions about um, European coverage and foreign coverage goes to the heart of those debates, because this is the definition of, of public, to my mind, is the definition of public service journalism. And I think people often confuse public service journalism with journalism that doesn't pay its way. You know, that's not automatic. The, the, the connection isn't automatic. We have a really significant, highly engaged audience of readers and, and, and viewers now and listeners who are interested in our European coverage, who are interested in our world coverage. So it's not simply that you know, the media needs, um, needs money where it's not going to make that money itself, but it's a question of how you, how you create a climate in which media organizations can come up with a, a sort of a prioritization system that is economic. Um, that might not be all that clear, but certainly put it this way, these questions that we're discussing here, I think at the heart of the deliberations, the sort of questions that are going to be deliberated in the future of the media question, I really hope, uh, hope they do well. Brilliant. Uh, yeah, look, there's a couple of questions coming in now, so I'll, I'll kick off with a few of them. Um, Owen Flaherty asks, First of all, he says, thanks for your talk, and you found it very insightful. Um, do you think there'd be much, you, you touched on this a little bit, but I suppose you could tease it out a little bit more. Um, do you think there'd be much appetite for pan-EU news? Um, he says, surely there's an incentive for the EU and big German French publishers to try break down those barriers to make it easier for news to be sold across borders, across member states. Um, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think there is an appetite for it. The question is, um... The question is who provides it and how do you pay for it, I guess. Uh, and, and also, you know, there's a lot of practical questions like you know, what language and, and what's, your, what's your distribution channel and all this. Um, you know, I mentioned that there are a couple of media organizations that are funded significantly or subsidized by the European Union. And a lot of them do really good work, but I'm not sure that that's the answer for everyone. You know, um, I think, I think there has to be a space for independent journalism that isn't funded by the European Union or by, by any state. Um, so really it's a question for those media outlets themselves as to whether they can build up a media, a, a, a business model, um, whether around advertising or subscriptions or both that, that can make it pay. You know, so I'm convinced that there's an audience. I don't know how big the audience is and I don't yet know how you would construct a business model around it. But I know that a lot of media organizations um, in Europe and, and around the world have been giving this a lot of thought. I mentioned Wolfgang Blau, he's been doing a lot of really interesting work on, on that very question. Um, so yes, I think there's an audience. Um, I'm not sure that having it funded by the European Union or by any state is the answer. So again, I come back to the question of creating a climate in which, um, in which media organizations can operate and that climate touches everything from you know defamation to um, tax systems and, and everything else. A lot of the questions that, that I know are being considered by the Media Commission actually. Okay, yeah, and um, thanks very much everyone for your response there. There's, there's a good few questions uh, coming in now. Um, David uh, Gary asks, um, the EU and crisis narrative tends to slip into news um, as many of UK-based journalists, you, you mentioned the UK in particular, have never spent time on the continent. Um, and, and he says even Tony Connolly himself 
Um, I don't know. This is he's quoting Tony Connolly, so we will have to um, trust him on it. Said he never truly understood things like the using of market until Brexit happened, until he got uh, involved in the weeds of the detail. And he asks, is there a way we can quality check journalism in terms of their knowledge and experience of the EU before they write on it? Um, I wonder what what your thoughts are on that. So the best quality check is to to pay for it or not pay for it, you know, to consume it or not. And that, that, that's the most traditional quality control mechanism we have. Um, let me just for a minute defend UK journalists, because certainly it wasn't my intention to malign them in any way. You know, I, there are really, really excellent journalists writing in English or, or broadcasting in English about the European Union. I mentioned some of them. You know, I read them and watch them every day. Um, they're some of the best people in the business. You know, it's certainly not about... Uh, about about disparaging uh, you know English language journalists, um, and it, I would also add that some of the um, media organisations that invest most in European coverage and treat it most seriously are also English language media outlets. Um, so that that that's worth saying. Um, what I think would be interesting to see is whether you know we know that for the last twenty years British media have been in retrenchment mode where it comes to European coverage. You know, a lot of them have cut back on their numbers in Brussels. Some of them have cut back on their uh, their bureau across the uh, across the continent as well. It'll be interesting to see whether, and I think actually that that was exposed during the Brexit uh, debates, where you know I mentioned some of those misconceptions about uh, about uh, you know about Brexit and about how, about the internal dynamics of the European Union. And I think some of that at least was attributable to cuts in, in you know, staff journalism jobs on the continent. You know, you, you saw very direct results of that. So it'll be interesting to see whether some of those media outlets will cut back further, whether they will lose interest in, in covering the European Union at all. I mean, it's not as if the European Union will become irrelevant to British interests, far from it. But, um, but we don't yet know what sort of effect it'll it'll have on 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 all those media outlets. You know, there are clearly some that will not cut back because uh, you know they have global ambitions, they have European ambitions, uh, and if anything, I think they will see logic in scaling up. Um, but I think that's one of the interesting questions over the next couple of years: to what extent does the British media, more generally, begin to cut back? Yeah, just a couple of questions here on. Um... So the regulations and media ownership uh, rules that are that are in place at the moment, and what it, what effect do you think those have um, on on media output and media quality in Europe? Um, and then the specific question then on state aid rules. Um, would would you think that state aid rules could be relaxed, um, and that this might sort of um, increase increase pan European media, um, or does this risk um, you know? Denigrating independence of the media. This is what the question the question asked. That's from Philip Crow. Um, I think, as I said, I think independence is is really important. I think, as a general principle, you know, diversity of ownership is is a good thing. Um, you know, you'll notice in a in a lot of the examples I gave of media organisations that covered the European Union well, um, there's a there's a pretty wide spectrum of ownership. You know, among them are media outlets that are owned by, in effect, single individuals or single families. There are media organisations like ourselves that are owned by, you know, that are owned by charitable trusts. That are there are organisations that are not for profit. Um, there are organisations that are run by big conglomerates. Um, I think I think the key point is is diversity. That you want to create an environment in which. Um, in which it's it's viable for different types of organisations to operate and to invest uh, in coverage. It's funny. One of the, I mean, I don't have any particular insight into the work of the the Media Commission, but I would imagine that one of the one of the critical questions that they'll be considering and weighing up, and where there will be differing views, is around the whole question of um, how the state funds journalism or how the state supports journalism you know this is this is at the heart of these debates um, some of us are very uncomfortable with the idea of any direct funding um, 
I know that in France, um, they have a much more relaxed attitude to, to that because you know, the state has been funding journalism in France in one way or another since the revolution. Um, some of it is indirect, you know, through the tax system. Um, you know, journalists pay a lower rate of tax. Um, there are all sorts of tax breaks available to media organizations. Um, you also have a lot of direct funding of media organizations and they have different sort of formula, formulae to, um, to weigh up and, and, and uh, weigh up the, uh, the funding available to every organization and, dip, and, and dole it out. Um, so you know, you, you'll find that there are very differing, um, that there are differing national attitudes that reflect the historical experience in each country. Um, but I think just as that's going to be one of the naughtiest questions before the future media commission here in Ireland, it's going to be one of the questions that that is going to that is going to weigh down any debates about pan-European media and the involvement of the European Commission in any such ventures. Yeah, yeah. Um, thanks very much, Raymond, for your response. There are a good few questions here now. Just one from a, a colleague of mine at the Institute, uh, Hannah DC. Um, she again thanks you for your remarks and says, really insightful. Is it time for national media outlets, not necessarily Irish, but you know, national media outlets across Europe, to move away from the Brussels correspondent model? and mainstream their EU coverage across the newsrooms. Um, could this help expand the understanding of uh, understanding and coverage of EU policy and decision-making processes in Europe? Um, any thoughts on that? That's a really interesting question. Um, I, think, I think there will be, I think there is a really important role and there will continue to be a really important role for journalists who are based in Brussels writing about the European Union because in the same way that it serves us really well to have political correspondents covering Irish politics, um, you know, the same is true of Brussels coverage, you know, that it, you really do need people sitting in the building, visiting the building, um, talking to the principal actors, attending press conferences, attending briefings, looking out for stories, you know, there's nothing like having somebody in the building uh, talking to the people involved. Uh, there's no substitute for that. But in the same way that our political coverage is not uh, the exclusive preserve of our political correspondents, you know, we have a, a whole lot of specialist correspondents writing about everything from the environment to education and health and, and everything else, who are writing about political issues every day, and they're, they, they, you know, they have relationships with, with uh, contacts through, throughout the political system as well as in the policy area and in their in their area of focus as well. So, you know, in the same way that we don't define politics as what goes on in Leinster House only, uh, we don't define, I hope we don't, it doesn't come across as us defining the European Union as what happens in Brussels only. You know, so our correspondent in Berlin, Derek Scali, our correspondent in Paris, Laura Marlowe, our correspondent in London, uh, Dennis Staunton, they write about EU issues all the time, but they're writing about them from um, from Paris, um, Berlin, and, and London. The same is true of journalists who write for us from elsewhere in the continent as, as well. So I would hope that in that way we 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 already are mainstreaming European coverage. You know, if you think of the way we write about economics, um, if you think about the way we cover the environment, I would argue that we cover them very much with an eye to European policy and, and European political developments. Um, but I think the argument is very well made and, and it's worth reminding ourselves of that all the time that you know, the European Union is not something that happens in Brussels, it's something much bigger than that. Uh, yeah, brilliant everyone, thanks so much for your response to that question. Just two questions on social media. Um, one from Stephen Frayne who asks, and um, do social media giants have a role or obligation to play when we're talking about this this media landscape being skewed um, in terms of the algorithms behind social media and how they curate the platforms and the, the feeds that people are consuming and then just a follow-up question then on that as well um, to what extent is the problem you're describing being modified and changed over time as we consume more and more social media. So, so two social media related questions there. Uh, interested to get your views on that, Ruan. 
Can you repeat the second part of that question, Doug? To what extent um, the problems you're diagnosing in terms of the, 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 the European um, coverage, you, you know, taking place primarily from outside of the block, is that being modified or changed over time as a result of social media? What's the question? Um, so I mentioned the global reach of certain outlets. Clearly, a big factor in their global reach is their social media reach. You know that that is that's clearly a factor in in the speed with which a lot of these stories make their way around the world. You know, um, all of these media outlets um, rely on social media as a distribution channel. You know, really significantly. So clearly, they play they play a, a, a very big role. Um, I hadn't thought of blaming social media. Maybe I should. Um, I mean, I guess, I guess, you know, these these issues play out on social media. When I'm talking, say, about misinformation, um, misinformation travels on social. As a, misinformation about the European Union travels on social in the way that all other types of misinformation travel. Um, so I guess it plays a role in that way. You know, so a lot of these stories. I mentioned the story, for example. This was a really, this was a really common view um, in, over the last few years. This view that um, Germany would eventually buckle in its negotiation in its negotiating stance towards uh, towards Brexit because of the internal pressure it would feel from uh, its domestic car industry. And this point was made again and again and again. Um, it wasn't true, and I think to anybody who was following the domestic German debate about these things, it would have been clear that that wasn't true. Um, and Eric Scully, our correspondent, wrote about this at length. A story like that gains legs because it travels, and it travels mainly through social media. So clearly, clearly there's a, there, there, there's a role there. Um, I'm not sure that directly the social media giants have a role in, in fixing the problem. I think ultimately it's a problem for the media organizations themselves to crack. You know, it's a challenge for media organizations themselves to come up, come up with a business model, if that's what they want to do, um, for pan-European journalism. And then it's a challenge for state or European state actors uh, to create the climate, a climate that's conducive to um, to public service independent journalism. So I'm not sure that, that that answers the question. I guess it's sort of a yes and no. Yeah, well, I, I think you're, you're, yeah, the, the way you mentioned the fact that, that the reach of these of these bigger organisations is is amplified by their social media presence, etc., um, that they're interlinked. You know, I think two two other questions here, Ruan, specifically on the Irish Times. Um, one question from Anne Fitzpatrick. She just mentions the podcasts that you have, and I think more and more people are now consuming their news through podcasts. Uh, she mentions, you know, you have the Inside Politics podcast. You've got the World View. Would you consider possibly adding, or do you think you'd be interested in? a dedicated EU podcast. I know, you know, depending on, uh, you know, what the story is of that week, you could get a bit of EU on more of you, you could get a bit of EU on inside politics, but would, would you think there'd be appetite and interest in a dedicated EU podcast? And then the second question, uh, specifically on the Irish Times, comes from Alex Conway, and um, he references, you know, you're, you're, you're referring to the FT, etc. Does your own organization, does the Irish Times have ambitions to become a Europe-wide paper of record, you know, to be more active in that Brussels bubble and consumed by that bubble and across the Europe, like the FT, uh, for example? If so, how would you go about achieving that? So two fairly different questions, but about your own paper at the Irish Times. These are really good questions as well. Um, on the podcast, this is just a, a sort of, a, well, often we, we have had, um, weeks and months where, you know, in effect, the worldview and politics podcasts have been EU podcasts, or at least have been European podcasts. And that's just in the nature of it in that, you know, when when the Brexit issue was, um, you know, was in the, in, in the headlines every day, when, when that topic was, was being discussed everywhere, you know, there were there were days I know, when we were publishing dozens of stories every day about Brexit, and, and when the story was that hot, you know, we were running podcasts almost every day, um, whether it was the the Worldview podcast, Inside Politics, or the Business podcast, where where Brexit figured and where European issues figured. My my hunch is that 
you know, of course, if you set up a, a European podcast, um, just as if you set up a, a, an EU newsletter or, or an, EV, an EU, you know, TV show, um, you would get a certain audience. You would get an audience of hyper-engaged um, uh, professionals in particular who have a stake and a, and a professional, maybe also personal interest in following that stuff really closely. But it wouldn't be huge. And I think what, um, what people are drawn to is less the idea of EU coverage than coverage of specific issues um, that might or might not be about the EU. But I'm thinking, for example, of you know, environmental questions, um, questions to do with, with travel, questions to do with you know, all sorts of policy areas that are where the EU is at the heart of those issues. But I think you would do it much more successfully if you, and you would find a bigger audience if you were to focus on individual issues than if you were to say, this is an EU, a themed podcast or, you know, regular feature. Um, as I say, you would get a, a certain audience for it, but it wouldn't necessarily be that big, certainly in a media market the size of Ireland. Now that's connected to the second part of your question, which is whether the Irish Times has, has, uh, has ambitions to do some of this itself. Um, you know, there are very real constraints and obstacles in the way for any media organization that wants to broaden its reach in that way. I mentioned that there's no pan-European ad market. I mentioned that it's very difficult to build up a subscription base from scratch in a market where you where you're not familiar with the market, where the market isn't familiar with you, where the audience isn't necessarily familiar with you. But what I would say is that um, you know, we, we've certainly noticed uh, in the last few years that there is, a, there is an audience for our journalism around Europe. There's a big audience for our journalism in the UK. You know, I noticed it a lot in our coverage of the Scottish independence referendum a few years ago, where a lot of people in Scotland and uh, in the UK more generally were coming to us because we didn't have skin in the game in a way, and we were trying to come at it in a in a in a fair and 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 uh, and balanced or at least neutral way, I guess, uh, compared to some of the media organisations in the UK that where they wore their politics on their sleeves much more, and we found it again over the course of the Brexit debates over those few years that we were finding a big audience in the UK. I've no doubt that you know a huge share of that audience was disappointed Remainers who were looking for uh, media outlets that they felt shared their view. Um, but I think a lot of it was people coming to it to us, and I'm sure we weren't the only Irish, Irish media organisation. I know RT got this as well, um, because their coverage was, was really high quality. But people coming to them and to us because uh, we were coming at it from a, from a, we were at a remove from the story, I guess. Um, you know, so clearly there's a certain potential there. But as I say, there are obstacles. There are the two I mentioned, and there's of course the, the language obstacle as well. Uh, thanks very much, Ruan. A question here again, going back to something we've 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 touched upon a little bit, and you've, you've given a bit of detail on on France in particular. It goes back to the funding issue again. Um, comes from Ross Patrick again. He thanks you for your for your interesting insights. Um, given the nature of the existing corporate media system. He says, which prioritizes profit over adversarial journalism. Um, have you come across alternative public media systems in Europe or around the world, which might serve as a more democratic alternative to the current corporate model? Um, and he references the corporate model being particularly prevalent in the United States and indeed in Europe. Um, any thoughts on that? I know there's some really interesting stuff happening in the US where you've got connections between um, philanthropic or charitable organizations and, and, and media outlets. You know, you've got a couple of, um, you've got a couple of, you know, public service oriented media startups in the, in the US that have managed really successfully to tap into that philanthropic world, which is much bigger and much better developed in the US than it is in Europe. And, and they're doing really interesting public service journalism as a result. You also have, um, Again, you see a lot more of this in the US than in the EU. A lot of um, mainstream or legacy, I don't know what the word is I'd use, legacy media organizations that undertake projects with philanthropic or charitable funding 
you know, so you'll come up with a, a sort of a, you'll come up with a project, <clears throat> a public service oriented project that um, you feel you can't fund through more traditional means and you will approach a charitable organization or a philanthropic group and say, do you want to collaborate with us on this? And there's some really interesting uh, stuff that's come out of that. Um, you know, the alternative model, of course, is um, to be nonprofit. And I, I say it in all modesty, you know, that there are certain organizations that, that, um, that I don't think do chase adversarial journalism over, over standards and over high quality because they're not under the same commercial pressures that others, that others, others are. Um, so, you know, th there is that. Um, but I think in an ideal scenario, you, you would have a competitive environment in which media organizations set up in different ways um, would be able to, to, to compete. Um, and, and because, you know, that would, that would lift the quality more generally, I think. Um, but clearly, you know, media ownership concentration, um, you know, the corporate dominance of the media sector, of course, these are questions that would play in, into all of this. But what I'd really like to see is a more, a better developed European philanthropic charitable structure around media organizations in the way you do already have in the US. Thanks for that, uh, Ruan. Uh, I suppose just a question of my own, um, slightly moving out of the of the media realm, but it's something you've referenced throughout uh, your remarks tonight, both in the Q and A and in the the initial remarks. It's, it's it's the issue of languages in Ireland, and it's sort of a perennial issue that we haven't really gotten the grips to. I myself lived in Barcelona for a year, did leaving start Spanish, and, and and can't speak a word of it. So, uh, you know, I think I think there's there's a lot of people like that who, you know, have, have been around languages, have studied them, but they just they just don't seem to stick. I mean, what, what, what do you think that is? Do you think it's laziness in our part that someone somewhere would speak English and would get away with it? Um, or, or what do you think the issue is? It's a big question. I mean, I, I think um, I, I've written a fair bit about this over the last few years, and, and it's be, I think it's because it's become much more acute, this question, since Brexit, in that, you know, the whole thrust of, uh, official policy towards the EU uh, since since you know once you leave aside for a minute the Brexit negotiations themselves the reorientation that has been talked about a lot since the Brexit referendum has been really about developing relationships post Brexit um, building new systems of alliances um, retaining Irish influence in a in in a in a, in a European Union where. Uh, you know, we've lost this, this key relationship. And of course, languages are central to that. And I know that there's been a lot of strategic work going on in the Department of Foreign Affairs and the Department of uh, Education as well around language learning. You know, we had a story just today about a discussion at Cabinet about the problem the state has in the shortage of Irish graduates who are joining the, um, the European Civil Service, joining the European Commission and other institutions. You know, there's been a huge fall off in the last in the last few years in the number of Irish civil servants working in the EU institutions. There's a big bulge of people in their uh, late 50s and early 60s who are going to be retiring in the next while, and and there's just not the flow of people coming coming through. And there are all sorts of reasons for that. It's a it's a cumbersome application process. You know, there are more opportunities at home now than there would have been 30 or 40 years ago. Um, but I think languages are are a big factor and. You know, it's been widely reported that uh, you know, Irish people, uh, Irish applicants often fall down on the language requirements when going for those jobs. I think there's only so much you can do about that in the short term. Um, you know, I think you really need to be thinking about how languages, foreign languages are taught in school, you know, secondary school, but also primary school. I think it, it would have to be at the heart of the education system in a way that it's it's not at present. I don't think it's enough to blame people for being lazy. You know, yes, we speak English and a lot of the world speaks English, but I, 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 I'm not sure that, that that's enough of an explanation. Um, you know, um, so it's not an easy question to answer. I think it's going to become much more acute as a problem now that Ireland is the, the only English speaking country left in the EU and that there's a lot of work that has to be done on, on maintaining and building these relationships. But as I say, it's not a it's not a question that can be solved overnight. It's a real, it's a real long-term question, isn't it? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks very much for your, your insights on that one. Uh, Ruan, look, a different question here. Just we, we've talked a little bit, I suppose, uh, throughout the, dis the discussion this evening about um, the possible limitations of, 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 of understanding of the EU within the UK uh, in sections of certain sections of the UK media. But a question here from Rob Enright asks, um, how well do you think the major EU outlets cover UK politics and, and their understanding of UK society? Um, you know, what would you say about that in terms of Brussels understanding, but also more wider across different member states? Mm, that's a that's a really interesting question. I think um, so. I can't tell you about you know European coverage country by country of the UK. You know, I, I know uh, I know I know Ireland. I know France. Um, my 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 sense of it is that. Um, I mean, I, I know them in that I read their media every day. Um, my sense of it would be that, you know, taking France for as an example, the coverage is the, the coverage varies pretty wildly, you know. So you've got a couple of media organizations that invest pretty heavily in their coverage of the UK, who have correspondents there. Um, in some cases, have several correspondents or at least uh, stringers uh, reporting from the UK. And so inevitably their coverage is, is better um, as a result of that. There's, there really is no substitute for having, having people on the ground and, and living in a, in a place um, to improve your coverage. And then there are outlets that rely almost exclusively on, on wire copy or, or on material that's written about the UK from, from France. And you know, there are organizations that have smaller budgets or are less, sort of, less oriented towards the, 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 the rest of the world. Um, so I think, you know, it's a difficult question to answer. I think there's there's a, a lot of high quality reporting going on about what's happening in the UK. There's a lot of really low quality reporting about events in the UK. Um, you know, we're in an unusual position because a lot of our coverage of the UK comes directly from there. Um, and and that, that obviously shapes the coverage of Irish domestic media outlets as well. But yeah, a bit of a cop out my answer, but I think there's a lot of good and a lot of bad. <laughs> And um, a question here from Alex, uh, again on the UK media. Um, notwithstanding the general trend of UK publications reducing their presence possibly in the EU and editorial stand, uh, slant, excuse me, uh, how do you think Brexit might affect the character of how the EU, UK outlets cover the EU? You already touched on this a little bit, given the fact that the UK is going to continue to obviously have a close relationship with the EU. It's in their interest to know what's going on. Uh, but how do you think Brexit specifically might impact the character of how they cover it? When we're covering the European Union, it's a domestic story, right? You know, so very often we're covering EU legislation, we're covering you know, a decision taken by a European, by the, the, the Court of Justice, say, that has very direct uh, implications for the state and for its citizens. Um, we cover a whole lot of European policy in that same way. So we're covering European affairs as a domestic issue. Um, in the UK, that's not quite true anymore. Clearly, it's true indirectly in that what happens in the European Union will continue to have a Pretty major effect on, on the on the UK, um, and not just on in obvious areas like like trade and economics. Um, but I think when that ceases to be a domestic issue in that very direct way, media coverage is bound to change as, as a result. Um, now, of course, there were a lot of UK media organisations that didn't give the UK much thought. Sorry, didn't give the EU much thought. To begin with, didn't give it much space, um, didn't give it much much uh, airtime. Um, so there's not much that'll change there. But there were other media organisations that did, um, and I think what'll be in interesting to see is what effect Brexit has on in that at that sort of higher end of the uh, the British media market. You know, to what extent do they succumb to pressures, economic pressures, to reduce their footprint? Uh, on the continent. I think the force that will mitigate that effect in a way is the, the potential for European expansion for these organizations. You know, so The Guardian, for example, clearly has uh, European ambitions uh, in the same way that it has global ambitions. 
it's, it knows that there's a massive market of readers on its doorstep, and I think it'll it'll continue to to cater to uh, to that to that audience. Um, but there are other media organisations that aren't oriented towards the EU in quite the same way. So I think it'll be really interesting to see. It, it, it's bound to have some sort of an effect, um, but it'll be interesting to see how that plays out over the next few years. Okay, Jerome, we're just coming towards the end now of the hour. I don't know if anyone else wants to, to throw in one or two more questions before we finish up. And um, Ruan, just one more question of my own. You mentioned in your in your column, and indeed you mentioned this evening as well, about those misconceptions or those myths you know, the, 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 the France is out to get Ireland on, on corporate tax and the German car manufacturing industry is going to step in, etc. cetera. Um, it does feel from consuming some of the Irish media um, around the economics issues that the corporate tax one is, is, is the one that looms, that this is some sort of, you know, uh, European effort to, to get Ireland. Um, I mean, what are, your, what are your thoughts on how that is portrayed? Um, in, in the Irish media and, and how it's interpreted here. I mean, don't get me wrong, there are a lot of, there are a lot of powerful, influential people who, who just really don't like how Ireland uses its tax rate um, uh, in the way that it does to, to attract multinationals to, as they see it, to undercut the European competition. Now, I'm, not, I'm not saying that that's not a factor, but <clears throat> what I was saying in you know, identifying that as, as a source of a misconception about the European Union, was that if you look in particular at the French debate about Ireland's corporate tax rate, it's much more complex than a French president feeling aggrieved about Ireland's 12.5% rate versus France's official rate of uh, 30 something percent, even though its effective rate is, is, is very much lower. And in the case of um, some very big French national champions, it's close to zero. Um, but, uh, you know, it's just, the point is simply that it's a much more complex debate than that simplification would allow. You know, so I was fairly convinced when I was Paris correspondent and covering these things every day that there was nothing Nicolas Sarkozy wanted more uh, when, it came, when it came to tax um, than, to increase, than to lower France's rate. But for domestic political reasons, he was unable to do that. And so the pressure on Ireland to increase its rate was an attempt to meet somewhere in the middle um, to achieve a domestic policy goal that couldn't be achieved using domestic levers because of the domestic pressure he was under, right? So it's really just that point. It's the point that a lot of these debates are much more complex than, than that sort of reductionism would allow. And it's not to say that there isn't a kernel of truth to some of those points, but just that there's more to it very often. And, and there's more to it in a way that you can only really understand, A, if you're in the country, if you're reading its media every day, or if you're served by good journalists who are able to explain it to you. Perfect. Uh, Ruan, two, two uh, audience members have uh, jumped in with their last orders for the questions. So I'm just going to put them at you now and, and answer them as concisely as you can. And we'll finish up at eight. Um, Anna Nichols asks, um, regarding, you know, aside from the political and social elements um, associated with the EU, how does the technical nature of most EU policy areas affect the quality of reporting, um, particularly on, you know, legislative changes, directives, etc.? Is it just too technical for, for, for mass consumption? Uh, that's one question. And then a final question um, refers to the Irish Times again. You've got correspondents in France, Germany, Brussels. Um, Irish readers can read the media in French, German, perhaps Italian, even Spanish. Um, but with, with issues becoming much more complex and pressing in other European states like Poland, with less familiar languages, um, where the Irish media has no correspondence. Um, is this a source of concern for you at the Irish Times and, and how do you think this could be covered? Um, so two different questions to finish on. Uh, appreciate the response of both of them and then we'll wrap up. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for the questions. Um, I, I mean, certainly the technical nature of the, the, the technical and protracted nature of EU decision making and, and, and lawmaking poses a challenge in that very often, you know, thinking in very practical terms here, you'll have a piece of legislation or you'll have a legislative process that has so many stages um, that it'll become almost impossible to report on each one, right? 
and to report on each one in a way that explains to the reader exactly what stage it's at and, and what's gone on before and what's likely to come. It's just not feasible in the sort of constraints you're working with day to day. So what you try to do is you try to you try to you try to come up with a way of serving your audience, telling them what's happening without doing any, without overly reducing or simplifying the process. You know, so you will tend to cover a story when it reaches an important stage in the legislative process. Inevitably, you will give more coverage to stories that you feel will resonate more with your audience. You know, that'll have a direct, um, a direct effect on, on, on people living in Ireland. But no question, you know, the, 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 the drawn out process of e European lawmaking um, makes it more difficult, more difficult to cover day to day. Um, the second part of the question was about Irish Times coverage of other EU capitals. The point is well made. You know, in an ideal world, we would, uh, you know, not unlike the Department of Foreign Affairs, we would have a, a correspondent in every EU capital. Um, but you know, it's just not it's not just not possible for us to do that. So what we do is we we you know, so Derek Scully does a lot of work in Poland, for example. Um, Naomi O'Leary, based in Brussels, travels, travels uh, well, she hasn't traveled a great deal during the pandemic, but before and, and after, I hope she'll get a lot more opportunities to travel around the continent as well. Um, we work we work with a lot of freelance journalists and stringers in places where we're, we're not served by staff members. And we also, very consciously, when we're, when we're building up the sort of partnership I described to you with um, those startups that specialize in translation and content sharing, we, we, we ask them for, you know, we say we're particularly interested in coverage of certain countries. Uh, I'm thinking of Poland and Hungary, actually, in particular, where we have a big interest. Um, we've had a big interest in the last few years, but don't have uh, 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 staff members. Uh, so we tell them we're interested in those countries and, and see, see what they've, they've got for us. But, you know, undoubtedly, uh, not having people in all of these places makes it more difficult for us to cover them, no question. Brilliant, Ruan. Look, uh, thanks very much again for your, for your time this evening, for your initial presentation. And I think we've gotten through a, a huge amount of questions. I think it's, it's you know, it's testament to the interest in this area and uh, that there was so much engagement. So again, thanks for, for your time and for your, your frank openness in the, in, in the Q&A. So uh, we'll leave it there. And, and thanks very much again. I look forward to, to, to having you again at some point in the future, maybe in person. Right. Thanks, Tara. Cheers, Ruan. Bye-bye.